What is it like, the sentiment? You're in the underlying technology. You're about getting new rails for financial, for traditional finance to run on in a more crypto, crypto a more underlying efficient technological manner. Are people being put off coming to you at the moment? A little bit. Um, I would uh, I have to say there's definitely lack of trust now in the space. There were a lot of people who were already distrustful of the space to begin with. And with all of these things, that the drama that's happened in the last few months, they feel like they are going to equate that with the entire space. I'm in the middle. I see a lot of activity. I speak to all different types of partners, builders, exchanges, uh, market makers. And I can tell you it's actually really just a small percentage of these people. But these, the small percentage of people have a lot of control because they're in large centralized entities and these are the really the bad actors speaking most of, people are good speaking of large and centralized that news about FTX not disclosing the names of the 50 creditors the top 50 this is supposed to be an industry about trust is there a problem here to not know who those top 50 creditors are as a crypto native I generally believe in full transparency and disclosing everything but in the situation we're in right now I almost feel like not disclosing a name is actually good because it could create bank runs at some of these places um, that's, that are still operating well. Talk to us, therefore, about what you worry in terms of contagion. You've talked about the lack of trust. You've talked about the worry of, of a lack of transparency. Everyone's now looking at the exchange they use or, or the tokens that some of the exchanges have, have, of course, issued themselves. Is contagion, is there more shoes to drop, do you think? So I think you guys have done a great job of covering Genesis. Mm -hmm. um, in my seat, I actually think Genesis is a bigger issue in terms of the capital markets of crypto than even FTX. Genesis was the largest lender out there. They, they've done unsecure as well as collateralized lending. Yeah. There's really no one else doing that lending. They, without them in the markets, all the people in the value chain, all the companies like market makers who need to borrow in order to do market making, you're going to see liquidity get sapped out of the markets, spreads widen, no investors want to come in, and you have a vicious cycle. So Genesis is a very important part of the crypto capital markets. And therefore, what, how much does it set it back if we do see a bankruptcy filing, for example, by such a juggernaut such as Genesis? Many, many years. Um, we're going to need some white knight to come in, maybe a traditional uh, finance player who's dabbled in the space and is willing to come in and take some risk. If you look at a lot of things out there in terms of instruments that trade, there's clearly a different sentiment from the TradFi community towards crypto versus the crypto native community. And you can look at it, the prices in terms of the futures curve, the CME futures curve, is, uh, you know, the out months are really negative for Bitcoin and Ethereum, whereas the perpetuals in the crypto native markets, which are also undated futures, are flatter. So it's not backwardation like so the what CME. do you think about trades like that? You look at that CME futures contract arbitrage. You look at what's happening with the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. These are financial assets like any other financial asset right now. Is it a good money-making opportunity or is it too risky to trade? It's an incredible arbitrage opportunity that you can make, you know, 25 percent on an annualized basis. But the issue really is you can't find a counterparty to help you put that trade on because nothing is flowing in the markets right now. The, the largest lender out there has a trickle ripple effect to everyone else is not lending. So if they're not lending, uh, counterparties are not taking risk either. What does the crypto market look like without that kind of leverage anymore? We go back to the previous cycle. We're talking about 2015 to 2018. Um, leverage needs to be controlled. Leverage is not bad. In every economy and every uh, uh, marketplace, you need lending and borrowing to some extent. Otherwise, you don't have money growth. And we need some of that back into this market to get the markets going again. I'm interested in this talk of a traditional finance giant, maybe a sort of kind of crossover investor who's dabbled already who could do that and have the will of the regulators, the will of, well, Washington on their side? Well, first of all, I think all the existing players, when this is all done, I think 80% of the companies in this current crypto capital markets will be gone. And the 20% that are still around, um, they're going to have to take a leadership role. They're going to work. They need to work with regulators and come up with good regulation. 
even if it's bad regulation, it's better than no regulation. And then you'll have perhaps banks come in to pick up the pieces and buy parts of the market structure because they'll be more comfortable and they'll inject a lot of liquidity. Or you have traditional market makers, whether it's Citadel coming in, they've dabbled in the Citadel Securities, or a Jane Street or well-known high-frequency funds who are very adept in this market. The market making side, but what about the traditional players here? We reported this morning, for example, Apollo is looking to list a digital asset strategy on a blockchain. You're doing something similar with a bunch of uh, counterparties, including KKR. So are they concerned, given the broader rhetoric around crypto? Because those tokens, your, your blockchain has a token as well. Everyone is a little concerned. I cannot say no one's concerned. But with that said, even if the capital markets and crypto are broken, the technology is still continuing. So Apollo's announcement of raising a fund using a tokenized version of that, uh, Ava Labs, Ava Lanch, uh, tokenizing part of a KKR fund, really shows that the technology and the innovation is going to continue and the benefits will accrue to the people who are in the space. And it's interesting, one of the conversations I had with Mike Cagney, who's the CEO figure about this particular announcement, was that stable coins could be mm -hmm. an onboarding ramp for these private equity funds. Can that happen? Is there enough security in the stable coin system as it exists today for it to be a feeder, essentially, into the traditional financial system in a bigger way? Well, yes, in terms of the security. And that's the ultimate benefit. When you have multi-parties that need to exchange information and payment simultaneously, that's the real benefits of a blockchain technology. So you need that token in that sense, whether it's a stable coin or a different token. That's the real benefits that you can provide to uh, cutting costs and creating more efficiency in existing financial systems.